Good afternoon. This church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world, declared the prophet Joseph Smith in 1834. Over the past 185 years since that statement, membership within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has grown to over 16 million, with an international presence in over more than 155 countries. As the church continues to grow beyond its headquarters in the Mountain West, temples continuously dot the globe. Beyond a quickly expanding footprint, temples have the ability to serve as non-literary texts, historical artifacts, and components of material culture, since every stone has a sermon. Indeed, temples are multi-vocal symbols of faith, which embrace geographical, theological, artistic, and architectural aspects of Latter-day Saint culture. A diachronic study of the architectural history and development of temples reveals shifts over time in what comparative historian of religion Lindsay Jones calls ritual architectural priorities. Building upon the, his conceptual map, um, model for interpreting sacred architecture, ritual, and experience, this paper looks specifically at the intersection of architectural conventions, religio-political aesthetics, and ritual contexts for temples. Likewise, Armin uh, Moss's theoretical framework of retrenchment and assimilation for Latter-day Saint history is used to identify how stylistic changes in architectural form or the unified appearance from standardization help to not only illustrate priority shifts, but also historical periods of isolation and integration. Each period's ideology contrasts with the other, but is vital to identity maintenance. Sociologists of religion argue that in order for a new religious movement to survive and prosper, it must maintain an optimum level of tension between itself and the surrounding culture. The pendulum swings back and forth as the religious movement seeks to strike a balance between the realms of assimilation and respectability to that of separateness, peculiarity, and militance. This paper looks critically at the last 70 years of temple architecture to ask the following questions. Why did the architectural standardization of temple plans, as we've already witnessed, help regain a unique sense of identity and legitimacy for the church? On the other hand, how do recent efforts to blend into foreign contexts by imitating traditional or indigenous architectural styles suggest another shift back into a period of assimilation. Moving into the 1950s with new prophetic priorities set forth by David O. McKay, the church began down the road of retrenchment through a re-emphasis of its traditional ideals. Some have suggested that leaders intuitively understood the importance of reeling back the religious and political culture of the church as though to recover some of its lost distinctiveness and societal tension. It was under President McKay that there was a renewed emphasis placed on the church's international building program, especially with regards to temple construction. The quantity of temples doubled in number during his tenure. The ability of a building to communicate messages about the faith and serve as a witness of the religion's uniqueness was revived. Some church leaders at the time even believed that a good chapel was worth 20 full-time missionaries as a proselyter. After World War II, temple architecture began to focus on several new objectives. These included increasing the availability of temples to church membership domestically and abroad, 
increasing the multilingual opportunities for temple worship, accelerating the manner in which temple ordinance work was carried out, promulgating the church's presence through increasing temple visibility to its surrounding communities, and lastly, design strategies aimed at producing functional, economical, and efficient buildings. The church's intention to help temples resist assimilation to the world and proclaim their peculiarity was further enhanced through the architectural standardization of floor plans and design elements between 1950 and 2000. This sought to improve the efficiency and functional performance of temple rites and ordinances, as well as portray a uniform aesthetic image for the church. Other benefits of standardization included shortening project schedules, reducing construction costs, and streamlining the design process. The concept of standard plans was not new for the church as evidenced in its meeting house program, but its widespread use became more prominent during this time period. The temples in Bern, Switzerland, Hamilton, New Zealand, and London, England, for instance, are all derived from a similar base floor plan with minor differences to exterior details. For several years, standard plan temples emerged in pairs, as can be seen in the Provo and Ogden temples, the Tokyo and Seattle, or the Bountiful and Mount Timpanogos temples. Six of the seven temples of the Pacific announced in 1980 April General Conference were designed using a, a new single-story standard plan. President Spencer W. Kimball uh, described his fir this first push of mass-producing temples as the most intensive period of temple building in the history of the church. Another 14 temples emerged with di on, on different continents in the mid-1980s, as has been explained, and were built using the standard hexagonal-shaped floor plan with six spires and an A-framed uh, roof. Similar to the Washington, D.C. temple, the use of the six spires at each end made reference to the iconic Salt Lake Temple. Likewise, in his desire to make temples more accessible by reducing their size, President Gordon B. Hinckley and a team of architects developed a remote area small temple prototype. This began, as was mentioned, with the temples in Monticello, Anchorage, and Colonial Juarez. We must build temples, more temples, and we must build them more quickly. President Hinckley told the Temple Sites and Construction Committee, this is the season to build temples. They are needed and we have the means to do them. Between the years 1998 and 2005, over 40 small temples were built around the world using this standardized floor plan, its interior and exterior finishes, motifs, and architectural elements. The only major differences between the temples were their orientation, their inscription location, their site plan, or their landscape design. From photographs alone, it is often difficult to differentiate one standard plan temple from another, since the design is nearly identical. The success of standardized temple plans, however, is their ability to provide uh, uniformity and continuity for the patron experience. Whether a member visits one of the standard plan temples in Columbus, Ohio, Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico, or Reno, Nevada, the ritual architectural experience is one and the same. One of the catalysts behind the five decades of standard plan development for temples may be tied to identity maintenance during a period of church history experiencing retrenchment. The creation of the Church Building Committee in the mid-1950s, for instance, brought centralized administrative control to construction projects in an effort to unify the Church's image by imposing what it called the international style on new construction of houses of worship. Likewise, the correlation movement of the 1970s has been viewed as a vehicle by which retrenchment was implemented on a church-wide level. 
The ritual architectural priority of standardization, however, stems not only from a need for economic expediency, but also the need to maintain continuity of doctrine among a global religion. The church's correlation efforts try to adapt its pro uh, programs to a variety of peoples and cultures. Nevertheless, it concluded that all members must ultimately worship in the same way, because if the programs were the same and the doctrines were the same, then the buildings should also be the same. In this sense, standardization was a powerful tool to unify the Latter-day Saint architectural identity for its membership. Most members would view the iconic architecture as a symbolic trademark of the church in their area, and therefore their assurance that the church had indeed arrived. For the outsider, on the other hand, the standardized Latter-day Saint temple may not communicate the same message. Instead, it may appear as an act of blunt intimidation that is aggressively foreign, since the temple's lack of regionalism or its environmental ethic, that was explained by Jen, um, and that language typically stands in stark contrast to the indigenous architectural styles. This only exacerbates the problem since Latter-day Saint temples are already viewed by outsiders and even some members as largely inaccessible because they are closed off to the public once dedicated. While the efforts of standardization have extended the blessings of temple ordinances to large numbers of church membership, it has unfortunately neglected many of the existing cultures, building traditions of each place. Many saw in worldwide standardization an alarming insensitivity to local cultures and styles, argues one critic. The uniformity of architectural detailing for standardized temples, therefore, communicates different messages to different audiences. At the beginning of the 21st century, we encounter another shift in ritual architectural priorities, which demonstrates the ongoing tensions between periods of isolation and integration. In the first two decades of this century, popular culture and social political views have continued to evolve and affect the church and her temples in different ways. In many instances, the sacred spaces have been transformed into contested social political spaces. Several policy changes to improve and soften the church's public image appear to indicate some level of assimilation and a partial reversal of retrenchment by the church, at least on certain aspects of doctrine, ritual, and policy. <clears throat> Who can forget the Mormon moment, coined by an opinion editorial in the New York Times, or the church's I am a Mormon campaign, and its documentary film, Meet the Mormons, President Gordon B. Hinckley's background in public relations and the introdu introduction of a series of changes in church policy, argues Armand Mouse, may have been part of the catalyst to pull the pendulum of ecclesiastical culture back somewhat from the retrenchment mode and toward assimilation. In the past decade, temples have reverted back also to an assimilationist attitude. This is manifest through efforts to blend into foreign contexts by imitating traditional or indigenous architectural styles. More recent examples of assimilation range in scope from adjustments to temple ritual to the revival of the classical tradition in temple architecture. Part of this stems from the challenge of keeping the underlying message relevant to members living in, living in different cultural settings argues Devery Anderson. In an effort to have Latter-day Saint architecture fit in with new cultural contexts around the globe, architects have been tasked with adapting local building styles and traditional architectural forms. Beginning in 2010, President Thomas S. Monson and others began refining temple architecture into, quote, more traditional, classical, and timeless design, according to uh, Managing Director of the Temple Department, Thomas Coburn. 
Part of the restoration of the principles of classical architecture involves learning from the past through historic precedents and using the sacred geometry, proportions, and patterns inherent in the cosmos. Once a site is chosen for a new temple, architects and designers perform extensive studies of the local culture and place in order to learn from the surrounding landscape, architecture, flora, fauna, color palettes, materials, and motifs. These findings are incorporated into each design in a culturally sensitive manner to reflect the local context and the vernacular building tradition. Such efforts to assimilate into the cultural context of each unique temple site and respect the local architectural tradition is an indication that the church's desire for acceptance and establishing an appearance of continuity with prestigious mythical historical forebearers, as well as an aura of order and legitimacy. Several recent Latter-day Saint temples illustrate the church's shift toward architectural assimilation and integration. Let me share two case studies. The Tijuana, Mexico temple, for instance, features Baroque-inspired details and utilizes a Hacienda revival aesthetic similar to early Spanish colonial missions. Like all religions and traditional architectural languages, explained traditional architect Andres Duani, this one at the Tijuana Temple is syncretic. Uh, syncretic, like syncretism. Several recent uh, Sorry. One apparent historic precedent for the temple is the San Javier del Bac mission in Tucson, Arizona. Comparing the two structures, one is immediately struck by the similarities in the tripartite tower design. The belfry is open on all four sides with balustrades surrounding the perimeter. It is supported by four flying buttresses embellished with Baroque scrolls and topped with a dome and lantern. Of course, the crowning ornament of the cross is substituted for the golden angel Moroni statue. Both religious structures feature whitewashed walls, arch colonnaded courtyards, scalloped recesses for windows, and ornate bas-relief geometric and scroll-like vegetal motifs. Likewise, the Spanish quatrefoil motif, motif appears in window art glass, furniture, grill work, ceiling medallions, gold leaf, <coughs> decorative paint, terracotta painted Mexican tile, and the shape of exterior water fountains. At first, one might think that the use of all of these architectural styles attributed to the darker history of Spanish colonial conquest versus the more native Mexican architecture could be viewed in negative light. The imitation and adoption of traditional forms for the Tijuana Temple, however, has garnered favorable responses from outsiders. Patrick Webb from the American College of the Building Arts in Charleston, South Carolina, says, this is a generally handsome, dignified looking place of worship that seems appropriate for its location. One of the building's designers, Harold Martinez, also reported that people who weren't members of the church that he spoke with during the construction process felt both a sense of ownership and an identity with the temple, even though it wasn't their religion. The Sapporo Japan Temple is yet another example which attempts to celebrate and preserve the cultural heritage of a unique place the architecture of the temple replicates traditional Japanese and Buddhist elements, design elements, motifs, patterns, and symbols. As observed by Daniel Smith, the temple's design is influenced by the Japanese government's National Daya Building in Tokyo. The four Toro lanterns at each corner of the tower's base, curved roof uh, corner details, and the pagoda-like tier tower each reflect vernacular Japanese design elements. The interior squared uh, circle motif is also used throughout the temple and is most notable 
and the ceiling and chandelier design of the celestial room. Instead of the typical curtain or Austrian drape used for the veil, the Sapporo Japan Temple uses sliding soji screen doors with intricate wood lattice frames. At the bottom of the grand staircase and in the exterior gardens, one finds Zen rock gardens. But speaking of the Sapporo Japan Temple, one commentator says, I am so impressed that the church builds temples that respect the native culture of its geographical location. They don't just build a temple in Japan, which looks like one built in Utah. There is incredible thought and research into designing an appropriate building that respects culture. Close quote. So in conclusion, in our quick journey across 70 years of architectural history for the restored Church of Jesus Christ, we have seen how temples have been viewed and read as a text. From periods of isolation to integration, each temple bears its own witness about the historical episode in which it was designed and then built. Efforts to assimilate back into society and foreign contexts have involved using localized, indigenous, or popularized architectural precedents to inform new design. On the other hand, retrenchment efforts aimed at restoring the church's unique identity have challenged often prevailing social cultural contexts or environmental the ethic. <laughs> Thus, the frequency of the back and forth oscillations from the swinging pendulum of ritual architectural priorities suggests the church is on track for maintaining an optimum level of tension between itself and the surrounding culture. As the, sh the priorities shift back and forth on the pendulum for temple design, however, architects and church authorities often face the ethical questions about how new proposals should impose their values on other cultures. And thus, the restored Church of Jesus Christ shifts between periods of isolation and integration separateness and assimilation, peculiarity and respectability, and thus the temple will continue to serve as a historical text and artifact. Thank you.